IBM machines can do the work. So that people have time to think. Machines should do the work. That's what they're best at. People should do the thinking. That's what they're best at. Machines should work. People should think. Machines should work. People should think. Machines should work. People should think. So this was a commercial from IBM from 1968, and it's uh, stream, still uh, extremely relevant, and, and I would assume relevant in the next 50 years as well. So uh, you must know that I'm a PhD student here at um, uh, KTH, and my supervisors are Joachim and uh, Gabriel. And for this seminar, David will be the uh, uh, evaluator. So I started in September uh, 2016, so a bit more than four years ago. And this is a photo from my first week. So uh, back then, uh, before the pandemic, we uh, used to start uh, our PhDs like that at teammates. Uh, of course, this is not happening at the moment, but uh, hopefully that uh, will be back soon. Um, so I should expect to graduate sometime in the summer, fall 2021. So that we don't uh, really know for certain yet. Uh, generally, I'm... Um, interested in, uh, in this thesis in embodied communication between humans and robots and overall within the topics of the uh, co-production of utterances uh, in installments. So one of the principles of the uh, least collaborative effort that may be familiar with. Um, and I've also looked at the effects of embodiment and conversational failures um, in the process of grounding. So overall within the um, intersection of um, HCI and AI. So basically how to computationally describe uh, interactions. And then of course here interaction is a fundamental element in this in this thesis. So that means uh, while I'm interested in systems, I'm more interested in how humans behave with the systems. So basically what, how, and when is a very important, um, you know, very important questions uh, that I will be asking. So here's a bit of a timeline of uh, what I've, I've done so far in, in this PhD. And of course, uh, a lot of this work has started with uh, a collaboration with uh, others. Uh, so for example, Interspeeds and uh, um, uh, ICMI and IVA, that this was collaborations with uh, Patrick and uh, Katha. And then I traditionally uh, kept more um, uh, focus on interaction conferences. So basically um, conferences like ICMI and, and CHI and, and HRI. And this is the last conference I presented a, a, a work at, which was supposed to be in Hawaii. It was done virtually instead, but that's okay. And yeah, to proceed, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some basic stats on this, uh, this, this so far. So I've um, submitted 26 papers in total, um, out of which 18 have been accepted. So th this is, of course, uh, uh, both uh, conferences, journals, and um, and workshops, and three are currently in review. So that's uh, one of the uh, uh, journal of uh, multimodal interfaces, one at uh, Frontiers in Psychology, and one at uh, Frontiers in uh, Robotics. So a total of 77 anonymous reviewers have reviewed this work so far, so 77 opinions, um, and I have reviewed 49 papers. A total of uh, 179 people have participated in these studies, um, and all of these have been in lab studies. And 284 crowd workers uh, have evaluated uh, the data. And sometimes these crowd workers were also for collection of, of data. For example, the work we did with uh, uh, Patrick and Katha in 2017. So basically, this thesis is based on three main corpora that I'm going to talk about uh, later. Uh, but eight data sets have been collected in total. And this is both human-human and human-computer uh, uh, interactions uh, data sets. So all of this data is available at, uh, actually no, most of the data is available at, K at my KTH uh, webpage, and they will be attached in this uh, thesis. And something else that is important is that mostly all of these uh, dialogues are task-oriented uh, uh, dialogues. So that basically means that we have this always this constraint constrained nature of the task, um, which gives us high exper experimental control, uh, but of course raises questions over its uh, ecological validity. Um, so for example, do models um, developed in this 
uh, data sets apply also to open ended uh, conversations. So the data sets uh, have been of various uh, types and with various uh, people and also sometimes very hardworking people. And of course, you may have seen things like this or like this. So the process is extremely complicated or things like this. And we also have multi-party uh, dialogues like this or um, data sets uh, with augmented reality, for instance, like this. And also this, which we never used. It's a robot-robot interaction. OK, so overall, um, of course, to collect these data sets, uh, we tend to use a lot of sensors. So I've used mainly uh, three types of sensors. So that's uh, motion capture, um, and mainly because it's very accurate and very robust. And uh, like, I was lucky to have Simon to introduce that to me uh, some years back, and I kept on using it ever since. Uh, I also used eye trackers to collect both uh, visual attention and also, um, for example, pupil dilation um, uh, data, uh, etc. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, different uh, microphones to collect uh, speeds. So, of course, synchronization uh, becomes uh, problematic with this, but uh, I have extensively used this uh, farming uh, framework that Patrick talked about uh, last week. And when I was at Microsoft, also um, uh, the framework called uh, SAI. So I was also involved in a lot of manual annotations. So these are mainly, um, let's say, objective annotations. So for example, segmenting uh, utterances or um, uh, annotating uh, back channels uh, uh, or annotating uh, manually segmenting uh, turns, but also some subjective annotations, for example, questions like, uh, does the subject look um, confused or uncertain? Um, of course, different modalities have been used as well, for example, from eye gaze to um, head direction and, and uh, gestures, and from robot platforms, mainly Ferhat uh, and sometimes Yumi. So the code from uh, uh, collecting all, uh, all this data is also available and more is coming up. So the main, of course, focus of this uh, thesis is common ground. So I will talk about a, a little bit more. So basically, we talk here about so how humans establish, maintain, and, and repair common ground. Um, and this is, in principle, the state where conversational partners mutually believe they have understood each other. And of course, in order to do so, they, they need to um, work together. So they do that with the principle of the uh, least collaborative effort. That means that they use the minimal effort to establish grounding with uh, incomplete utterances that can be repaired, if necessary, of course. And they do so by reformulating or, or uh, repeating uh, previous utterances. And they exploit a lot of different modalities in that process. OK. So the first one you should take mm -hmm. is the frame, but the one with the stripes, pick the black one with the stripes. Perfect. So what we see here okay. um, is that, for example, here the speaker doesn't produce one uh, a uh, complete one-shot utterance. So he instead chooses to provide information incrementally. Uh, so, the, so basically, he splits these utterances into, into small installments and, and gives gradually the um, information to the listener. There are many speculations why, of course, people, people do that. Uh, and I will talk about them a little bit further. But we do know that humans do instruct in installments. And we have also uh, seen it in our um, uh, corpora. Um, one of the speculations is that this is uh, that it's a, it, it, it's a less direct approach. So basically, it, it becomes less threatening to provide information incrementally. So that means if the message is too detailed, the speaker might have put uh, more information than necessary. While if the, the message is not detailed enough, uh, there may be a need of uh, subsequent clarifying discussion. Of course, another reason could be that. Uh, uh, a lot of uncertainty, of course, arises in the process of grounding, and then the the, the speaker is continuously helping the um, uh, the listener with more and more uh, fragments. So let's look at the previous uh, uh, short segment from the speaker's perspective. Between them. Okay. 
So the first one you should take is the frame, but the one with the stripes, the black one with the stripes. Perfect. And now from the listener's perspective. Okay. So the first one you should take mm -hmm. is the frame, but the one with the stripes. Okay. The black one with the stripes. Perfect. And also what happens in their eye movements during that? Which between them. Okay. So the first one you should take is the frame, but the one with the stripes. The black one with the stripes. Perfect. Okay. So the first one you should take mm -hmm. is the frame, but the one with the stripes. Okay. The black one with the stripes. So the question is here, can we detect, um, for example, uncertainty? If uncertainty is one of the reasons why speakers uh, choose to um, produce uh, these instructions in, in installments, uh, is it because the, the um, listener has provided some signals of uncertainty? Um, so, for example, here what we have uh, seen a lot, the answer is yes, that we can detect uncertainty and we have seen that there's a lot of scanning behavior um, when uh, the, the listener seems to be uncertain. So, for example, look at the eyes again of the listener when the speaker says uh, stripes. Okay. So the first one you should take mm -hmm. is the frame, but the one with the stripes, okay. the black one with the stripes. So that's the scanning behavior um, I was talking about before. I don't know how well you can actually see the videos uh, streaming, uh, but I hope it makes sense. Um, so what we want eventually to do is that we want to inspire these uh, studies that use models from analysis from human, um, human data and evaluate them with um, social robots. So these robots, of course, need to be able to uh, deal with communication breakdowns and uncertainty, and they need to detect incrementally when humans require more information. So that means that they have to adapt the repair strategies um, incrementally. And we know, of course, that the role of both the robot and the user is to incrementally and continuously repair uh, common ground. So of course, the uh, channels of communication are also important. So there's, of course, face-to-face -face communication um, to uh, uh, other types of communication, so the, such as computer-mediated media communication, as we're doing right now. Um, so there must be fundamentally a difference in how we establish common ground through these different channels. So for example, now we have this restricted uh, field of view uh, through the camera and, and a narrowed uh, acoustic spectrum, uh, which is also more different when we conversing over the phone or when we're texting. So the, the main idea I want to follow this in this thesis is that these differences in channels of communication also apply to how we communicate with um, uh, social robots. So you can imagine that social robots and, and humans interacting is, is uh, similar interactions to face-to-face uh, -face human interactions. Well, for example, smart speakers um, are closer to human conversations over the phone. So now if I asked you to look at this uh, uh, sentence, for example, and try to make some sense, Of course, you can understand quite a few things, but uh, of course, there's a lack of context. So let's see if we add speech as well. And so uh, I want the next part to be a white board. Put a line view there with like a lot of black squares. Yeah. So we can, of course, identify already emphasis in certain parts of the um, of, of, of speech and also where installments are actually. Uh, uh, happen. Uh, and these are the traditional relevant uh, places that we can see. Um, and so, right. uh, I want the next part to be a white board. So you can see, of course, when you have all the channels available, then there's the process is much more uh, synchronized and coordinated. So overall, the topics uh, in this uh, thesis, uh, topics in mutual understanding, um, they involve, uh, as I already described, uncertainty, the least collaborative effort, how embodiment uh, is, is uh, involved in this, in this process, and how misunderstandings uh, in the form of conversational failures. So with this uh, uh, work, we make contributions to psychology, to human-computer interaction through empirical studies, and we also provide uh, implications for the design of conversational interfaces. So start with uncertainty. So um, we, some of you may be already familiar with this. Um, 
uh, we have collected this uh, Chinese whispers uh, corpus. So this is a multi-model data set that uh, in which subjects are instructing each other how to assemble uh, an IKEA uh, stool. So here we use the concept of uh, Chinese whispers. And we do see a lot of uncertainty and hesitations that are naturally introduced in the process of grounding. And the corpus consist, consists of um, 34 interactions. So basically in each interaction, the, the subject first assembles and then instructs. So we don't give any um, uh, verbal uh, instructions, but only uh, visual indicators. And basically the uh, topic of the conversation is, is, is um, along the uh, instructions and, and we basically see a referential use of, of language. So this is what instructors um, uh, see. And basically they have to help the speaker, sorry, the, the builder uh, uh, establish, uh, achieve the task. So Chinese Pispers is an old uh, children's uh, game, which you may know as um, broken telephone. So that means that, for example, we have um, here Samuel that instructs Eva. And when he's done, uh, when they're done with the task, he leaves and then Eva becomes the instructor. And then a new person comes in to uh, take the role of the builder. So we want to see here, do instructors influence subsequent instructors? For example, in their verbal descriptors or uh, paralinguistic components. So we do see that speakers basically uh, continue to reformulate until they have established common ground. And we know that they cannot continue the task until they have actually do so. And we also see that participants are instructing for the first time, which means that we, we see this collaborative um, construction of instructions. So first we attempt to do a reference resolution. So we want to see um, if we can detect uh, the object they're, they're talking about. Um, and of course, multimodality here is important. And uh, to do so, we, we use visual and uh, linguistic elements as cues of uh, ground communication. So we basically want to identify the saliency of an object as a binary classification task. And that by using linguistic references, the uh, instructors and the builders um, gaze, head and pointing gestures. Uh, so that was uh, one of the first works. So we, we basically find that, okay, so speech and, and um, head or gaze are basically the two more uh, fundamental uh, modalities that actually help in the uh, uh, resolution of objects. However, if we look at only speech on its own, it does uh, extremely bad, uh, almost a little bit better than chance, while gaze does have some information encoded. So since uh, we said that construction uh, instructions are, are um, um, produced in a collaborative nature, we also want to see how the signals of, of, the, of the listener affect uh, the, the production of instructions. So here we, make, we want to make the view that the um, uh, decisions of the speaker to reformulate uh, utterances is fundamentally based on the listener. So what we do is that we try to predict uh, using nonverbal features if the speaker will decide to reformulate an utterance given only the listener signals. So we use, uh, again, a, a, a random forest uh, classifier. And we incrementally, in every uh, new instructor utterance, we try to predict what's going to happen next. Is the speaker going to reformulate or continue to the next uh, part of the task? And we do find that using the listener signals is a fundamental construct in, in the speaker's decisions to um, reformulate. However, as I said before, this is unclear if models produced in this type of uh, dialogues uh, also generalize to open-ended uh, conversations. So for example, one of the main uh, features that was important was this scanning behavior, uh, which we wouldn't expect that it would be as uh, informative in uh, open-ended conversations. So moving forward to uh, this collaborative effort. So as I said before, uh, this is, uh, we're talking about the principle where uh, speakers use the minimal effort to establish grounding and they basically introduce utterances in installments. And then, so that's the first one, you got that one. Now the second part you need to pick up is this white uh, stick here. The one with the, with the six black dots. boxes? Yeah, the six black boxes here. Perfect. So you take the... So you take the uh, 
the black square similar to the white one it's on your on your right on your, on your right exactly the one with the dot exactly okay so i hope the videos are uh, being uh, streamed well so basically you see that uh we, we actually see quite a lot that speakers uh, do uh, tend to package information in, into fragments. Um, and, uh, and we do think, of course, that happens a lot due to the uh, uncertainty presented by the, by the listener. So since we're talking about least collaborative effort, so here we want to see how cognitive effort is allocated among the group. Um, so uh, to do so, we, we use a pupil diameter uh, as a marker of cognitive processing. And uh, yeah, we, we use the concept of fragmented utterances. Um, so this is basically this coordination strategies that, uh, that speakers use uh, to further facilitate the core production of utterances. So basically, instead of produ producing one instruction in, in one um, utterance, they, uh, that is straightforward, they, they leave the extra work uh, to the speaker, sorry, to the listener, um, the, ex the extra work of understanding. So we, what we do here is that we separate the utterances to two types. So there's either an instruction that can have one single utterance or an instruction that can be presented as a, as a series of fragments. So we're talking basically about the same object, uh, but how many utterances are the, are the speakers using to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, construct this instruction? And how we do that is that we basically uh, find, we hand segment these utterance boundaries um, uh, by uh, places that are either internationally complete or, or have a significant period of silence. So these are basically transition relevance places, um, meaning these are moments in the conversation where the listener could have taken the turn, uh, regardless if the turn actually switched. And uh, as I said, we use pupil dilation for um, uh, the group's pupil dilations for, for um, uh, looking at their cognitive resources. Um, a little bit of a background in, in pupillometry. It has been used as a response system uh, to stimuli and it has been an established method in uh, psychophysiology. So it has been used in, for example, language production and comprehension, also to detect mismatches in the uh, visual context, uh, prosody and syntax. And it has also been seen to be affected by, for example, speech rate. Uh, that's also something that Patrick has looked at, uh, or prosody or, or speech planning, and as well, grammatical complexity and ambiguity in syntax. And interestingly, it also appears to be affected by pragmatic manipulations. So for example, <clears throat> in indirect requests, uh, as in uh, if we were in a room and the window was open, and I said it's cold here, versus an uh, utterance that says close the window. So here we make um, two basic assumptions. So we think that uh, speakers spend uh, less cognitive resources in producing this one shot uh, complete instructions rather than fragmented, uh, fragmented instructions that are adapted to, um, to listeners. And we also believe that speakers continuously attempt to reduce and minimize the listeners' cognitive load. So that's, of course, in their interest to be able to achieve uh, a common goal. Uh, so we also want to see this process incrementally. So, so what we do is that we Look at this fragment, and we take and we look at the at the group's data, how how it incrementally uh, gets produced uh, as long as they go along with the with the instruction. So we extract some um, temporal multi multimodal data, and that's the pupil diameter and and their uh, uh, eye gaze to the reference objects, as well as their joint attention and, and mutual gaze. And we also look at some uh, uh, speech, or actually language uh, features, such as the number of words, and also the uh, TF-IDF uh, scores. So these are the uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency uh, scores that basically reflect, let's say, how much uh, information is contained uh, in its utterance. So here, basically, we treat this um, uh, its instruction as an information retrieval task. So this is an example of, um, uh, the, the, of the pupil diameter changes during a, a, an instruction. Here, basically, we see the uh, uh, so yeah the the y-axis is the pupil diameter in millimeters, and, and this is time here. Um, and uh, what we do is that first we take so there's of course two two data points, uh, one for its um, eye for the pupil, 
And of course, what we do, we only need one, uh, one of those. So we take the mean uh, value. Um, because of course the left and the right eye are highly uh, correlated. And when some of the uh, uh, data of one eye is missing, then we take the one that we have at hand. But however, you can see still that the, the signal is relatively noisy. So for example, uh, places like here, this is uh, what is likely to be uh, eye blinks. So in order to solve this, we apply um, a low pass uh, butterworth filter uh, to smooth the signal and, and remove uh, um, uh, sensor noise. And also we interpolate the missing values, of course. Right, so what we find is that, how, how do complete and fragmented instructions differ? So basically we see that complete instructions uh, tend to have uh, fewer words, but at the same time, they tend to be more informative. So they have uh, much more uh, unique, uh, uh, they're described in a more, much more unique way in comparison to the rest of the compass. So they're basically less words and more, more precise. And we also see that the, um, the, there's of course a, a very relevant to the, the cognitive load of the, of the speakers as well. So for example, here we see, this is a measure that we extracted to, to see how fast is the user, the, sorry, the listener uh, detecting the reference object. Um, and what happens to the pupil diameter at the same time. So you see, the longer it takes for them to detect an object, the higher their cognitive load. But at the same time, the better information presented by instructors, the lower the cognitive load. Oh, sorry, yeah, this is here. Um, uh, this is the, uh, yeah, the, the, the best information presented, the, the faster they uh, identify the referent. So we also see that, um, uh, right, so here now we see basically each utterance in, in, in progress. So basically, you can imagine that this is one instruction, and each of what, uh, each one of these utterances is uh, a, a fragment which is part of the same instruction. Um, so here we want to see what happens incrementally while the speaker still speaks and the uh, listener tries to comprehend. So we see the builder is increasing its, uh, their attention to, um, uh, to the object. And we also see that the instructor is increasing their attention to the listener. So this fits the idea that, of course, they, they're interested in, in their in their ascendancy. So they want to see what the builder is, is doing and if they actually understand each other. And we also see that the um, uh, joint attention is converging. So basically, these new utterances from the speaker are successfully um, able to uh, resolve ambiguities. Uh, right, so here, I forgot to say, we, we fit um, linear mixed models. Uh, because we have several uh, utterances per speaker. And uh, this is what we find with our, with our cognitive load. Um, so basically, here we see that that's the uh, data of the, of the builder. So basically, yes, they do um, minimize, instructors do minimize the, uh, the listener's cognitive load. And we can see basically, they are successful in uh, resolving ambiguities as we can see that the uh, 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 cognitive load of the, of, the, of the builder is reduced. However, at the same time, what we can see, this is interesting. So their own cognitive load is actually increased. So this means that this adaptation process actually takes uh, a lot of effort and it's, it's actually a demanding uh, task. Right, so we predicted that uh, the speaker spent less cognitive resources um, in producing complete instructions. And we did found that um, the instructor's cognitive load was higher uh, in complete, uh, sorry, in fragmented than complete instructions. And we also saw that the builder's pupil size decreased uh, while at the same time their uh, uh, instructor's pupil size increased. So this, this again shows that audience design is an, an adaptation or demanding tasks for speakers. So here we think that, of course, what, what, should, uh, what should a conversational interface do uh, when they instruct um, humans? And we, we do think that they should produce instruction in fragments, uh, basically imperfect human-like speech. And of course, not only with um, uh, incomplete utterances, but also with discourse markers and, and disfluencies. And at the same time, they have to find a way to maintain the balance of, of transmitting of the information that is being transmitted. So this, uh, of course, calls for a few questions that are still open uh, for discussion. So for example, how much information should the robot uh, transmit in fragmented uh, instructions? Um, or when 
and how should the robot elaborate or, if, or formulate previous um, utterances. Um, for example, different information may need to be presented first, uh, and this could matter. And, and it's also important to know what social cues um, uh, a robot should attend to in order to take decisions on these um, new fragments. So these findings uh, present opportunities for uh, investigation with, uh, with robots. So what we want to do is that we want to conduct studies where robots instruct humans in installments and empirically examine how, how well um, uh, the uh, production of installments actually um, um, helps uh, uh, resolve ambiguities. Right, so, so basically this um, should show some individual user adaptation uh, or the concept that is also called uh, recipient design. Um, and this is something I'm currently working on here at Potsdam, um, together with uh, uh, David and, and Jana. So this is an, an experimental paradigm where, where they have used in the past um, with, with, this, with this type of uh, pentominos. So we designed an interface that um, looks at the, uh, at the user data in real time and tries to make decisions over how it will uh, produce utterances in the, in the next few seconds. So of course, this is incremental work, a lot of uh, the work that uh, David has done in the past. So now, of course, since we're talking about an interface, the question of the embodiment uh, comes back. Um, so of course, how this embodiment, how this robot would look like will fundamentally also change how the uh, behavior of the, of the user will, will be um, uh, uh, presented. So that's, of course, because physical embodiment raises expectations. So um, we, we make use of two different uh, types of robots to uh, ask questions in, in embodiment. So something that we call transactional to relational um, types of interactions. So we have uh, an experimental uh, setting where, uh, the, uh, the, where we have robots instructing uh, humans how to uh, uh, cook. So this is a little bit different from assembling uh, furniture, but the fundamental idea is the same. So we have someone that instructs and someone that uh, needs to complete the task. So this is, um, of course, uh, uh, taking out of some, some recipes uh, that are non-trivial. Non so what happens is that uh, we have the speaker, the, the, yeah, the um, uh, robots that have knowledge of the task, however, the, um, uh, the uh, users do not. So they do depend on, on getting all this information extracted by, by the robots. So we examined three different types of embodiments. So this is, uh, one here is a smart speaker, um, which can only interact with um, uh, using speech. And then two robots, one that does not have a, a gaze behavior, but only looks, at, um, uh, only looks at the user statically. And then robot that has a basic um, uh, turn-taking uh, gaze mechanism. So we do know that, um, that humans are intellectually biased towards social activity. Uh, so we want to see what are the effects in human behavior when simulating anthropomorphism and nonverbal uh, social behavior. So again, we use uh, multimodal input to look at these differences. So this is uh, uh, speech and visual attention mainly. And uh, we here in this corpus, we have 30 participants in a within subject um, design. So basically they interact with all um, three uh, devices. So what we find is something um, that we thought is interesting is that, um, so we see of course differences between the uh, smart speaker and the robot with the case behavior uh, when it comes to, for instance, interaction time or, or the number of turns and questions. However, the robot, even though it has a face, uh, it tends to be much more similar to, to uh, uh, a smart speaker. And that's of course because of its uh, behavior. So this indicates that, of course, adding um, a couple of eyes on a smart speaker doesn't necessarily make it a much more social uh, interface. And we see the same uh, things applying in, in the case behavior. So they tend to look more, um, users tend to look more at the robot that also reciprocates case than the robot that does not. And um, at the same time, we also find an interesting interaction effect when it comes to acknowledgements. So these are basically back channels to um, uh, robot instructions. Um, here we actually see that the face does play uh, a role um, in, in the production of um, acknowledgements. 
<clears throat> so, right. So taking a closer look at the uh, case. Um, so we want to see, okay, why is that case? Um, uh, why do they look more and, and where exactly does it happen? So here, okay, so here we have the uh, robot with a case uh, behavior and here the robot with no case and here the smart speaker. So we see that right before uh, the robot speaks, uh, users tend to uh, shift their attention to the robot. Now, already at, uh, before the robot has finished uh, speaking, uh, in these two robots, uh, users are already uh, attending, shifting their attention back to the task. While basically here with the robot with the case behavior, they tend to maintain their case much more. So basically, this is a polite thing to do in face-to-face -face communication and, and they wait for the robot basically to finish its turn and then move on to the task. So we do see that uh, human verbal and nonverbal behavior shifts uh, with more anthropomorphic agents. And we also do see that face-to-face -face, um, interaction is preferred. Uh, of course, it's interesting to know what happens in cases of misunderstandings. So how, do, how does embodiment affect um, uh, this behavior when failures arise, for example? We approach failures um, with the concept of uh, contingency. So basically, this is when the um, intensity and timing and, uh, and um, quality of other signals reflects the ones that we have sent. So in, in robotics, of course, you can see this as a correlation between the robot behavior and uh, changes in its uh, environment. So last part of the work is uh, the work we did here in conversational failures. Wow, it smells great. It's good too. Wow, it smells great, but I hope it tastes good too. I hope so too. Uh, how many carrots was it again? Sure I can. Okay, it seems to be stuck. Wow. Okay, uh, you may have seen the video before. Um, Right, <clears throat> so, so why failures? Why should we uh, uh, study failures in, in this uh, context? Um, well, generally fail failures uh, can be critical uh, because they require uh, human intervention and, and also they require much more effort uh, to resolve ambiguities. Um, and of course, most uh, research assumes that interactions will be um, uh, flawless. Um, uh, nevertheless, we do know that uh, failures are inevitable with, uh, with uh, systems. Um, so how we do this is that basically we um, use a set of failures informed by uh, taxonomies uh, in, in the previous studies. And uh, these are basically typical robot malfunctions that have been reported before. And they can be either task oriented or, or some kind of social uh, protocols of um, uh, violations of social protocols of home interaction. And all the failures, of course, have the uh, consequence of delaying uh, users in a task. So we have five um, main um, types of failures. So in this failure, for example, we simulate this process of losing the user engagement. So the uh, system restarts and, and starts interaction from the beginning. An example is like this. We have already started. We have already started. <laughs> Uh, and in this failure, for, for example, um, we time um, as, uh, the utterances of the uh, uh, robot improperly, and we, after a short delay, continue the instruction. Next, take the... Take the one. Mushroom and add it. And uh, in this uh, type of failure, uh, we simulate a uh, lack of uh, user input, speech input. So the robot doesn't respond for 20 seconds. I'm done. What is next? I'm done. I'm done. What is next? Oh, this is not working. I'm done. Take one spoon of red cabbage and put it in the spring roll. So you can see clear signals of, of um, frustrations uh, when this happens. 
Um, in this failure, for example, we uh, repeat the previous statement. Uh, so basically, we ask the user to do the same uh, instruction again. And finally, we see uh, we uh, produce an erroneous instruction. So in this context, we ask the user to pick up something that doesn't exist. So we're using these uh, failures above. Um, we have humans engaging in this referential, referential communication task. It's the same um, type of setting as we uh, uh, had uh, in the previous study. And um, we, uh, again, of course, have non-trivial recipes. So users have to um, interact with the robots to successfully complete the task. So uh, first, we start with um, segmenting the interactions into, into dialogue acts. Um, and we make certain that robots can uh, respond to clarification questions. And we also, of course, uh, don't tell um, uh, the users that they're operated by humans, um, but we do so to um, dismiss technical problems. And then, of course, we want to see what's the difference uh, when, when different uh, types of robot fail. Um, so, for example, we do know that uh, smart speakers and human-like robots uh, differ in uh, interactional uh, affordances, for example, transactional versus relational. So, does that uh, does robot abandonment uh, affect positively human-robot interactions also when they fail? So, that's what we want to uh, uh, look at here further. So, we have two types of robots. Again, an Amazon uh, Echo device and, and a fair-haired robot. Uh, so here we skip the middle uh, condition we had in the previous um, uh, study as we want to focus more on the abandonment rather than the behavior. And um, at the same time, we also want to see <coughs> how, how much does actually the failure matter. Um, so uh, for in introducing some kind of a, a severity into failures, we uh, use a time pressure. So as you can see, we use a timer uh, next to um, the uh, participants and, and we um, expect that under time pressure the same failures basically would have a, a higher severity in the interaction especially when you expect that um, uh, when, when the, the failure delays you from completing the task so how do we do that we say that we, we, tell, we tell subjects that um, uh, if they finish the task in the top 20 percent of all interactions then they will have double their reward and of course, these failures delay them from uh, being fast in the task. And at the same time, we also tell at the, at the end of the experiment, we tell subjects that um, if the time that the time was not at the top twenty percent, and then we ask them to do the uh, uh, post-task uh, questionnaire, and we of course debrief the participants that this is a, a part of the uh, study manipulation. Um, yeah, and of course, I didn't mention that. Uh, only half of the participants are introduced to time pressure. So we use basically here time pressure as a, as a within, um, as, or as a between factor. So we have 44 uh, subjects um, and two different uh, factors. One of them is robot abandonment, which is uh, manipulated within subject and then time pressure or failure severity, uh, which is manipulated between. And we use a set of different behavioral and subjective measures. And we also, of course, want to test if uh, time pressure is, in fact, um, uh, working as a manipulation of, of uh, you know, inducing these higher severity of failures. <coughs> so we first segment the um, interactions into uh, the interaction segments into no failure and failure, and and then in these segments we get um, temporal uh, multimodal measures uh, from uh, gaze and uh, speeds. So very similar as before, we have uh, the case to the robot and, and also the case uh, shifts from the robot to the task. And uh, we also have the number of words and the uh, time they take to respond. We also take another measure. We ask subjects before they come in the in in interaction, how likely are they going to use this uh, uh, system regularly? And we ask that for both uh, uh, robots here. And after each interaction, we ask this question again. So we're going to see basically how much does the use of failures hurt the interaction as well. And we also look at trust and, and perceived intelligence uh, measures extracted from uh, Godspeed. And at the same, and finally, we look at uh, uh, social presence, um, which is basically four different uh, dimensions uh, into co-presence, attentional allocation, um, methods understanding and behavioral interdependence. 
So we do see uh, that the manipulation of time pressure works. So the uh, subjects that um, um, interacted uh, in the uh, time pressure spent, it, uh, spent much less time than the ones with no time pressure. So they, they are indeed uh, rushing to finish the task. So then we look at the uh, multimodal measures and we see that, for example, gaze tends to be higher when uh, the human-like embodiment is, is um, uh, present, so, same as we have seen before, uh, but at the same time also more, um, uh, more gaze is also used when, when failures occur. So this is, this is some kind of a, um, attempt to resolve the failures. We also look at uh, the gaze shifts. We see that um, when uh, there's no uh, time pressure, then the um, uh, the participants shifted the gaze less frequently. So this is some. So basically, they, they have a less social behavior because they uh, they're trying to focus more on the task. When it comes to speech, we see uh, similar uh, effects, but in the direction of the of the smart speaker. Uh, so here again, we see more speech is uh, exists when um, uh, failures occur, but uh, generally, more speech uh, exists with the uh, with the smart speaker. Um, Right. So, what happens with the um, uh, with the intention of, of future usage, as as we talked about before, we do see that uh, the, there's not a significant change in in the human-like embodiment. So we see here basically that before and after the interaction with failures, they um, they basically like the robot the same. While with a smart speaker, it actually hurts interaction um, uh, much more. We also see differences in um, uh, trustworthiness, predictability, and competence, for example. Uh, but we don't think that this is anything that has to do with failures, but generally some preference over a, a human-like uh, embodiment. <clears throat> so apart from this, we also look at the uh, all the social presence dimensions, and um, we see a clear, a clear uh, distinction of uh, uh, embodiment again. So there's a preference for, or there's a perception of presence more for the human-like abandonment, which also also affect the process of grounding, of course. Uh, while at the same time we find an interaction effect. Um, so what this means here is that um, when participants are in, in uh, no time pressure, yeah. So when participants are in no time pressure, they understand the um, uh, smart speaker. Sorry, the human-like. Uh, right. No, they, they have an easier understanding of the human-like uh, robot. When in high time, when, when uh, uh, time pressure, they understand to the, the smart speaker better. Right. So, so finally, we want to see. Uh, okay. So now we know that the robot has done a failure. Can we actually detect this? Can we actually go back in time and say, okay, maybe I said something that I shouldn't <clears throat> as a robot? So we do. We we split this. Uh, two states of interaction. So one of them is that everything is going according to how the interaction should be going, and the other one is that there's something, um, there's something that indicates a failure. So first we ask human um, annotators. No, actually not annotators. We, we ask human um, uh, subjects to to tell us if they think the uh, uh, se several parts of the interaction uh, include failures or not, and then we train a machine learning. Uh, a round forest classifier to detect the same uh, thing. We have <clears throat> we have two uh, in lab annotators and 192 uh, uh, online. So basically, they watch um, the uh, the videos. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, they watch the videos and they try to to detect if um, there are elements of. Um, uh, confusion, for example, or, or uncertainty, or if the person looks distressed, etc. And we also ask them how, how engaged uh, the people uh, appear to be. <clears throat> so then we also use the same time segments, um, and then we ask uh, a machine learning classifier the same question. So did a failure um, occur in this, in this uh, last few seconds? So failure here we represent with um, uh, changes in behavior. So we look at case and, and speech uh, features. <coughs> and we also look at uh, body movement. Uh, 
Right. So we uh, first see actually statistical differences in engagement. So what does that mean? So they tend to engage more with a robot when it fails, which uh, means, of course, that they need to resolve the failure before moving on to the task. And then we also see that <clears throat> the annotators are better at detecting the states of uh, no failure than, than failure. Um, and when uh, no speech features are presented, then we can see it's actually much harder. So this uh, indicates the uh, importance of, of speech and context in, in failure detection. And we also see that um, uh, right there, the classifier also is better at detecting uh, no failures than failures, but we don't see a significant uh, difference in embodiment. So basically, it performs uh, equally well. Um, and then again, we want to see at what features are, are uh, representative or activated. So the, um, the head movement um, appears to be the most important factor. So this is basically a, um, an embodied um, contribution to the ground. Um, it's expected to work well in, in these task oriented dialogues. <coughs> and then, uh, yeah, so then we, we see that the, um, um, the gaze uh, features are more prominent when the human-like robot is uh, present. But at the same time, we see a preference for speech features uh, with the smart speaker. You can see here with the, uh, um, uh, we can see the a very clear separation of the of the failure classes uh, in the human-like uh, robot embodiment when we look at case, and uh, also a clear separation between uh, uh, the uh, speech features as well um, uh, for the smart speaker. So that means that the models, while they work equally well, they're inherently uh, different. So uh, different features are activated depending on what embodiment is uh, presented. So this is important um, as, of course, it changes uh, what models uh, should robots consider. So we did see that um, uh, users change their um, intention to uh, interact with a failing smart speaker, but we didn't say the same with a, a human-like embodiment. And uh, we also did see different uh, levels of intelligence and competence ascribed to the human -like robot. And um, yeah, and finally, we did see differences in attentional location and how people attempted to uh, resolve failures. So of course, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, a human likeness is always um, uh, favorable because we did see indications that uh, in time pressure, actually human, the human like embodiment appear to be uh, distracting for, uh, for users. So we did see that they tried to uh, be less social when the, uh, they were trying to save time. So overall, uh, we do think that robot embodiment affects how users uh, will interact and also how they will uh, respond to failures. And that means that designers should consider also the nature of the task. Um, for example, in time pressure situations, uh, a higher error as well is expected. And their non-anthropomorphic designs potentially could be uh, beneficial. Um, and this is also important for failure detection mechanisms. Um, so these mechanisms, they might need to consider also the robot's physical design in their failure detection model. So with this, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, all these uh, institutions uh, for uh, hosting me so far. Uh, KTH, of course, uh, the most important of, of them, and as well, University of Southern California, uh, Microsoft Research, and the university I'm currently at Potsdam. And I also want to thank all these people, you know who you are, and some old DMAs people here, and all of you, of course, from our meetings, and um, of course, my uh, supervisors uh, who have um, helped me uh, shape this research so far. Thank you. I'm happy to take any, any questions you may have. I can take the first question. Do we record the questions as well? So why not? Okay. I don't know how to raise my hand, so I just 
can I ask a question? <laughs> All right, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question about the work. I don't know which slide it was or uh, which exactly the work, but do you study cognitive load um, right. in one work? Um, and in that work, I, I'm looking at my phone because I wrote it down because you did so much I uh, otherwise couldn't uh, remember. Um, but you hypothesize that uh, people try to minimize uh, their cognitive load, right? Which makes yeah. sense because we try to do that. <clears throat> That's like known from psychology. But then um, what I wondered about, why do you hypothesize that a complete instruction would um, require less cognitive load than uh, incremental instruction? Because don't we break up stuff um, in chunks to reduce cognitive load? And if all, if a lot of people actually are incrementally giving instructions, don't we inherently do that to minimize cognitive load? I was just confused or surprised maybe by the hypothesis. And I was wondering what was the motivation for that one? Yeah, so maybe I didn't, uh, I wasn't very clear on that. Um, so we didn't expect the, uh, the uh, listener's cognitive load to be um, uh, lower, but the instructor's cognitive load to be lower. So for them, we expected that having uh, an utterance, for instance, like saying this one here, is easier, cognitively speaking, uh, uh, than an utterance that includes much more information also in fragments. So yeah, so I was referring to the uh, speakers and not the listeners' cognitive load. So for the listeners' cognitive load, uh, we expected what you also just said. And so how yeah. did you define the cognitive load? Um, I, maybe I missed that a little bit, but how did you measure it again? It was some measures, I think. Um, right, so that's the, the pupil dilation. Okay. Um, so, so changes in, in pupil dilation are either because of uh, light, for example, but that we have constant, um, mm -hmm. or uh, higher cognitive load. Okay. Um, the, there has also been other ways in psycholinguistic to, to do so. For example, the, the um, um, number of pauses and silent pauses that you use also right. indicate that the number of eye blinks, for example. But there seems to be an agreement that pupil dilation is a very strong um, indication of cognitive load. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that clarifies my questions. May I ask the next question? Yeah. Uh, okay. First of all, thank you for uh, <coughs> it was really an impressive work. Uh, I have a question regarding the um, last uh, thing that you were presenting uh, about uh, the social uh, robot, the uh, Ferhat Plus, that speaker that you mentioned that they preferred, the user preferred uh, when there is a time pressure, they preferred less uh, so like um, social uh, robot, uh, than that speaker. Then uh, is it, the, the speaker still, I think, uh, in terms of embodiment was less social, but the dialogues were the same, I guess, yes? Right, so so we, see, we saw differences in, in their behavior, uh, which is how we um, uh, assume that um, they, there's a preference for, for less uh, social embodiments. So, so for example, we saw, what we saw is that when, um, there's when there's a failure then there's of course uh, uh, an importance of, of doing a lot of case shifts so you have to try to resolve the failure, the failure and therefore um, and that's an indication of how you how you try to do so but when there was no failures we saw a, a decrease in case shifts uh, for time pressure well not for time pressure so and this is because we assume here that th this some of these case shifts are are, um, uh, are social um, uh, and then they basically cut away all the social gates in you know, order to focus on the task. Um, so that means that some of the social behaviors of the robots might be distracting when the user is trying to focus on the task. So this is the type of assertion we, we're going towards. And then the next question, gaze was uh, the most important part for them for uh, the first study that you presented to us that uh, assembling stuff, I guess? Uh, to resolve failures, yes. Gaze, uh, uh, it was relevant, of course, to the robot, but to, to the human-like robot, gaze was the most important factor. Um, Is it something that we can uh, 
think that, okay, this was like specifically to your study or is it something that we can extend it to other studies also? And if yes, that ha ha which type of studies? Uh, how do you mean? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, the, the results from that uh, assembly study uh, that you mentioned, uh, how we can uh, extend uh, the importance of different, uh, different uh, uh, social cues, how we can extend those uh, results to other studies. Well, um, well, I guess you could you could say that in you know at least in the context of mutual understanding, um, you could say that uh, you know what available channels uh, exist um, also affects how 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 well you can also coordinate in mutual understanding. So you could extend this by by looking at either even either uh, less uh, channels of communication available uh, and then trying also to resolve failures. For instance, how, how would you resolve a failure with a chatbot uh, through text uh, or uh, with with a social robot or with a, so so I guess what available channels you have for communication uh, is is what would uh, matter if if this is what you ask. I'm not sure if I, I fully follow the question. Yeah, yeah. Hey. I have a related question about this. I, you you talked about experimental control versus psychological validity, and. Uh, I, I think it's it's really exciting, um, yeah, really exciting uh, studies you presented, and and uh, there are a, a lot of questions that can be raised about this, the the particular um, characteristics of the task. But my so my my question then re related to to this has to do with if if the task requires a particular uh, modality or such as you, I think you mentioned scanning behavior. In, in some of the tasks, does uh, the, my question is, does this influence then uh, th things like like gaze um, behavior or uh, I, I think even in one of your I, one of your um, figures showing that gaze behavior increased and then and then waited until and, and then decreased until the the task was 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 um, finished. But but uh, can, can you see in your different experiments evidence where the type of task then influences the 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 communicative behavior uh, and and the use of of uh, modalities? Yeah, no, I think so. Um, so this have have followed more or less the same the same. Uh, uh, type of uh, uh, type of uh, task oriented dialogue. So you, you always have basically this is instructional use of um, language. So you basically you see okay. So we, we transmit information and you need to do, comprehend this information and do something with it. Um, so uh, this of, this of course, should of course change a lot in, in non task oriented dialogues, but also in task oriented dialogues that uh, do not involve uh, this type of information transmitting. So you could have someone that um, explains. No, no, sorry. Yeah, you. What did you say? Something. No. No, no it was just it, it. My screen just turned on. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah. So in terms of this uh, experimental control over uh, validity, it's something I've, I've actually borrowed from uh, from uh, Jens. I think Jens has talked about that uh, in the past. Um, and and. Uh, yeah, so you do have uh, a lot of uh, control, uh, and and you do have um, a very constrained nature of how things can can work in the interaction. So that means that we do expect users to have some certain behavior that is inside this interaction protocol. Um, so uh, that gives us a lot of uh, uh, interesting results of what happens if we manipulate different. Uh, things, for instance, like the social behavior or the, or the abandonment. But of course, it restricts a lot of how far we can get to, to applying this to any other type of interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say, in this, or being on the safe side, any task that involves instruction in a task oriented setting, I would say that this should be able to apply um, and we should expect to find the same behaviors. Great, thanks. 
And then I think Hanna had a question or? Uh, yeah, if I may. Uh, thank you very much yeah. for the very nice presentation, Dimas. Um, I, I have several thoughts and I'll just uh, try to, to, to ask one question, which I thought was kind of interesting me sort of uh, to double check whether I got it correctly or whether you sort of like um, have, have thought about it in that way sort of when you mentioned the, the failures that you're interested in I was wondering like do you tie it back to the the cognitive load as sort of like the cognitive load then shifts from the robot sort of like the instructor to the person who's left there like hanging in this silence um, whether you could sort of like argue that or whether it's completely I don't know made up and then I've other things that I've been wondering about but I guess there's yeah, that's actually interesting. Um, so we haven't had any any uh, pupil data from uh, uh, from the failure studies. Uh, so that's something uh, that we would have to figure out other ways to measure that. But in a sense, you could say that this um, balance process of of uh, having the collaboration load uh, constant, then you do uh, eventually give the burden of the cognitive load to the to the user because uh, you have provided them with uh, uh, false uh, instructions. Uh, so the question is now, of course, this is just for experimental reasons, but the question is now, how do you how do you resolve that? How do you minimize again the, the load of the user for being able to do what they what they what do you ask them to do? Yeah, so that's silent, yeah. I found the raise hand button. So I can raise one. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, um, because in one study we asked them, you know, if people were likely to, how likely are you going to use um, such a system in the future? Um, it started me thinking on long term studies. So all the studies you've done are kind of like one time uh, studies in the lab. Uh, but it doesn't mean that as researchers, we can't think because I'm uh, from your motivation, it all sounds like, okay, we want to have interactions with robots and um, it's going to be more and more. So have you any uh, intuition on how we can use your work for long-term interaction or maybe re repeated interactions and how the results might apply to those or might it maybe not translate to that? Yeah, that's, that's a, a good point. Also getting back to uh, David uh, points as well, because we should expect that in long-term interactions, the uh, robots are also able to have a, a little bit more sophisticated behavior than um, uh, the type of behaviors that we had. So we were very re repetitive in some parts uh, with what the robots could do. And um, so of course you would expect in, in long-term interactions, these effects perhaps would, um, you would see them minimizing. Um, um, then again, you also don't want to have long-term interactions with continuous failures on, on purpose. So you, you probably want to find a way to um, maybe learn from what has happened now in order to resolve this failure in the future. Um, so I think interesting studies I would, I would think of would be to how to either mitigate the failure uh, in, in long term um, and, and learn what's the best strategy to mitigate the failure. Uh, but still actually leave the failure to happen. So you don't necessarily want to um, um, only detect and, and, and avoid failures, but also you want to be able to uh, learn what's the best way to, um, to resolve them. And, and that, that may be also different uh, in, in, for every person. Um, so that's what I would expect in, in long-term inter interactions. Uh, uh, so yeah, to, to, for example, uh, examine. Great, thank you. Yeah, any other questions or discussions I would be happy to uh, talk about. I mean, if we, I mean, if we have time, I don't know how long this seminar should last, so I'm not sure <laughs> how much time I should take, but um, okay. Gustav, do we have time? <laughs> You're the moderator, yeah. right? I mean, uh, I usually book the room, Phantom, for when we do this physically for two hours. So okay. the answer to that, if we extrapolate from that, is yes. We have time. Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because I actually am interested in the work you're doing currently. Um, so um, because it was a nice seminar on the work you've done, um, but you're also doing very interesting work right now. Could you maybe tell like shortly what it was about? Because you told about the task, um, the elephant in blocks or something, um, but it was very quick. So maybe can you explain yeah, no, it? Yeah, exactly. I didn't, uh... 
talk much about that. Um, so yeah, we, we want to we want to basically take these um, uh, production of, of instructions in installments. We want to take it into uh, um, an experimental setting with uh, uh, conversational interfaces. Uh, actually, Hannah has been involved in this uh, line of work as well, um, and we. So we, we want to see what what happens when actually robots do this. So there's many things that we, we should expect there, of course, and, and and that's something that so humans always tend to um, uh, you know um, uh, follow the maxims of quantity. So you know they, they will not give a lot of information, and they will try to be as as uh, brief uh, as possible. Uh, it's interesting to know what happens if robots do this. Um, so. Uh, you maybe are expecting that it's okay for a human, it's not okay for a human to violate the maxims of quantity, but maybe it is okay for a robot, um, because that's maybe how robots uh, speak. Um, so we want to basically see, you know, this, this in practice. So how much information should uh, you convey? Uh, how should you uh, decide also to, um, uh, to uh, provide additional information? And what signals you should look at? So, for instance, um, if I told you, you know, can you pass me the salt, and and you're not looking at the salt, then I should say maybe something more. You know, it's, it's on your right, or you know, it's on your left, etc. So, we, so we try to basically add more, more and more information incrementally and see um, how that changes uh, behavior, and also what what do humans uh, do with these uh, devices? Do do they actually prefer robots that um, do? Uh, produce uh, instructions in fragments, or do they prefer robots that um, uh, have some kind of adaptation uh, strategy, uh, or, or no adaptation strategy, for example? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think um, a lot of the things you talk about are, uh, if, uh, you know, when you have an interaction, then you ask people in hindsight maybe what they're thinking, or if you're studying the signals during the interaction. Um, in what way or to what extent do you think we should include maybe also the expectations? Um, in front, and do you think it's a good way to maybe um, influence people and their expectations prior <clears throat> to an interaction so that we set the standards instead of, um, because they might expect, you know, like a very cool science fiction kind of robot that does things in a way and we are designing because they have this expectation, um, or do you think it's not really a problem and we can just... Yeah, no, I think I think that was actually a, a, a nice um, measure we tried. Uh, yeah, when we worked together at the Kai paper, um, mm -hmm. so the first time I actually tried this, and I think it, it is if you done if you do this carefully, I think it's actually a, a really interesting measure. Um, of course, you you don't want to give too much information uh, to actually have some kind of a priming over what will happen in the interaction, but you maybe want to ask some things. Um, same, similar, for instance, to this negative attitude towards robots uh, scales. So, you know, you want to ask some things beforehand and something afterwards, uh, the same things afterwards, to see how this particular interaction and this particular manipulation affected their their uh, view of, of, of things. Uh, so this was the first time when we did this together, and I think actually it was an interesting uh, results with, which I didn't expect. Thank you. We can talk more later. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah, Hannah. Uh, yeah, I have another question if, if there's time. Like, I don't understand the format fully, I think. So uh, please tell me if. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, go ahead. Um, so. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering about gaze. I, I, at some point, like, I think all your data shows that gaze is quite important. And then at some point, you said that people look at the robot because it's polite to look at the robot, like at the face. And I felt. I, I don't know, I have some questions about this. Like, I kind of feel that we, we look for more than just to be nice to the robot in some way. So I was wondering whether you could clarify that or whether you have thought of, you know, uh, looking more into this, because I think in a way, like there is like in conversation analysis, a lot of papers that show that people are sort of like, yeah, use gaze a lot. So I've been wondering or was a bit surprised that you kind of just said, oh, it's polite. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, that was an expression over why why this would happen. Um, is that of course you use case as well from from a turn taking uh, uh, perspective to um, decide when is the right time to um, take a turn, etc. Um, so so the interesting thing was that we can see that they're interested in the task and, and they do want to get things done because in, with the other two robots they immediately turn to the task um, and they must want that 
um, increasingly they must want that with this robot as well, but they do wait a little bit with their case uh, before they actually switch to the task. Um, so now the question is why this robot and not the other two? Um, and of course, politeness or uh, basically just uh, uh, following the social protocols of interaction uh, could be one reason, but the other reason is that they may be just waiting for it to finish its turn. Um, so that's how I said, this is the polite thing to do that, you know, I, I wouldn't interrupt you by already doing something before you have actually finished your turn, if, if you were to, uh, instructing, for example. Can I, I was just wondering, like, could they also be looking for kind of, I mean, if you realize that the robot does have gaze behavior and is looking around and not just looking straight all the time, could that also be a way to monitor where the robot is looking? Like, I've been wondering, like, where was the robot looking? Because if you yeah. monitor, like, where the robot is looking, you will see whether the robot looks at, you know, please take the salt, yeah, yeah. sort of. And for that, you need to, to have the gaze on the robot. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the robot, do, of course, does gaze at, um, at the ingredient it um, uh, refers to. Um, however, you don't, you don't need uh, the gaze to, um, to be able to identify it, uh, because we also don't know that a robot without gaze can also uh, uh, make people understand what, they're, what it's talking about. Um, so it could also be that, yeah, you, you're waiting to see uh, what, is, what is going, it is going to do, uh, and if maybe case provides more information uh, than what you already have. Yeah, any, any other questions? I cannot really see the hands or... Doesn't look like there are any other questions. So why don't we thank the speaker again? And thank you for uh, listening to me for almost an hour. <laughs> um, uh